This podcast assumes that you have a general knowledge of the Tate LaBianca murders. Sharon Tate Polanski, Jay Sebring, Wojciech Frykowski, Abigail Folger, and Stephen Parent were murdered on Cielo Drive in Los Angeles on August 9, 1969. Lino and Rosemary LaBianca were slain in their Los Feliz residence the following night. Charles Manson, Charles Watson, Susan Atkins, Patricia Quinwinkle, and Leslie Van Houten were convicted of those murders. Say hello to the Goodbye Helter Skelter podcast. Hi, I'm George Simpson. Welcome to the 15th episode of the Goodbye Helter Skelter podcast. Today, I'm going to take this podcast in a new direction. I have already presented a summary of my take on the Tate LaBianca murders, trials, and convictions, and I have reviewed three books that I thought needed commenting on. But I can't go on reviewing books about the case forever. Most of them are worthless. I mean, how much time can I really spend on something like this? Instead, I'd like to tell you what I think you should read. Hundreds of books have been written about Charles Manson and the Tate LaBianca murders. If you're a collector, you have a hobby. But if you're a researcher, you don't need them all. Here are ones, though, that deserve consideration. Of course, you have to read this. This book is a classic, but you really don't have to read it. This book might be the most radical book published in 1988. It was the first book to present an honest, unbiased picture of Charles Manson and the phenomena that surrounded him, a Charles Manson that most people had never seen. When The Manson File came out, I thought it was important enough that I bought copies of it and gave them away. If you can't get the classic original edition, you can buy the second printing on Amazon. This recently republished version of the 1988 edition is standalone in Manson literature. Extraordinary and controversial are just two words that describe it. Whether you agree with everything in it or not, Nicholas Schreck's comprehensive magnum opus should keep the Manson conversation going for another 50 years. It is also worth it to read any book written by anyone who lived at Spahn's movie ranch. Charles Watson, Susan Atkins, Paul Watkins, Diane Lake, Lynn Fromey. And that would also include, unfortunately, this book, even though it is in no way what it purports to be and is full of misinformation. But you will run across it many times in your research, so you should at least be familiar with it. And of course, I would recommend my own book. And that's all I have in the way of books. If you can think of any that I might have missed, please let me know. Beyond books, I recommend that you read all that you can of court transcripts, parole hearing transcripts, media interviews by case participants, law enforcement subject interviews, and law enforcement reports. And that's about the end of my reading recommendations. Beyond that, I would get into field research, but that's another topic for another day. Now, Let's look at a phenomenon that is common amongst researchers in this field, and that is the apparent belief that all bits of evidence that have been gathered in the case have to be connected to the murders. In other words, they think that every clue has to fit into a grand picture that will finally reveal the truth behind the Tate-LaBianca murders. As such, they make the mistake of spending a lot of time and energy chasing after seeming clues that have nothing to do with the murders. Two examples of this have come to my attention recently. The first example concerns a set of steak knives that are listed in the Tate Property Report dated August 12, 1969. The tip about this entry and those knives came from an online source who claimed, this set of steak knives was reportedly given to Roman and Sharon as a wedding gift. If Roman and Sharon Polanski's wedding set of steak knives was found at the intersection of Angelo and Sunbrook Drives in Bel Air, that would strongly suggest that the killers took the knives and that after the murders, they didn't just drive down Cielo Drive to Benedict Canyon Drive and turn left, 
to end up where we know they were at Rudolph Weber's hose at 1 a.m., but instead took a more complicated back way out of Cielo that took them down Cielo Drive to Shady Brook Drive, south on Shady Brook to Hillgrove Drive, west on Hillgrove to Angelo Drive, then north on Angelo to the intersection of Sunbrook, where the knives were ditched, then continued north on Twisting Angelo Drive to eventually come out on Benedict Canyon, just south of Easton Drive, where fresh murder victim Jay Sebring lived. More about that in a minute. So, what to make of this steak knives clue? That they were recovered from the bushes at Angelo and Sunbrook Drives 48 hours after the Cielo Drive murders can be reasonably assumed, for after all, there is a police report noting it, even if the cops got the name of Sunbrook Drive wrong, which should show you that although police reports are good sources of information, they can also be flawed and should be verified as much as possible. But did these knives come from the Tate House? The only indication that they did comes from the internet source, who said that the knife set was reportedly given to Roman and Sharon as a wedding gift. But reportedly by who? That we don't know. And since we don't know, we don't know what primary source, if any, there is for this assertion. The first thing that got my attention about these knives was the notation that they had brown plastic handles. Plastic handles. Roman Polanski and Sharon Tate were married in London, England on 20 January 1968. It was a high, hip society affair attended by scores of show business people and other glitterate. The reception was held at the London Playboy Club. The Polanskis received many fine and expensive wedding gifts from their friends, colleagues, and other well-wishers. A set of steak knives with plastic handles? That got me curious about Regent and Sheffield steak knives. If they were treasured wedding gifts, they must have been pretty nice, yes, plastic handles notwithstanding. So, I looked them up online, and sure enough, they exist in many forms. But they are also very cheap, both expense and quality-wise. Today, you can buy as many as you want, even vintage sets from the 1960s, which sell currently for about $20 for a case set of six. This could be the actual Cielo set. Now, I'm not insisting that a set of four cheap, standard, plastic-handled steak knives were absolutely too chintzy a gift to give as a wedding present to such a glamorous couple as the Polanskis, but something tells me that if they did receive such a gift, they wouldn't have been so overwhelmed by it that they would feature it in their house on Cielo Drive over a year later, where it could easily be picked up by one of the killers, likely the ever-troublesome Susan Atkins, and later ditched a few convoluted blocks away. What ties these knives to Cielo Drive? This brings us back to the original tip about the knives from the online source who claimed that the knives were reportedly a wedding gift. But that again raises the question, reportedly by who? That is the question that should be asked of the poster who brought the knives to our attention. Because without a known source stating that those knives were indeed the Polanskis, the claim that they were is just that, a baseless claim. And if the claim is baseless, then there's no real reason to believe that it's true, because it could just as easily be false. And since the claim is baseless, the connection between the knives and 10,050 Cielo Drive is, alas, equally baseless. So, there is no reason to explain how the knives got from 10,050 Cielo Drive to the bushes at Angelo and Sunbrook Drives if they didn't. Thus, the police report notwithstanding, I think the knives can be disregarded with regards to this case. They didn't have anything to do with the murders and were likely left in the bushes by someone with no connection to the crime. Now, if there was any actual evidence that the Polanskis received the knives as a wedding gift... But wait! There! Alas, that is obviously not a steak knife, likely or an implement the couple was using to open their gifts. If there was a case of Regent and Sheffield steak knives in this photo, then there would be a reason to follow up on the clue of the knives found in the bushes. But there isn't, so there isn't. Another lead that people are following 
is the notation on the property report of items taken from Cielo Drive, the day the murders were discovered, that among many other things was a black rubber electric wire cord. The wire was reported by police forensic chemist Joe Granado as being recovered at Cielo Drive, but with the notation Sebring Home. This cryptic notation seems to dovetail with the revelation, discovered by Chaos author Tom O'Neill, that Paul Greenwald, the son of Jay Sebring's lawyer and part-time electrician, had installed a state-of-the-art electrical cable TV system at Sebring's residence, a system that controlled the TV, drapes, lights, and music throughout the house, and that Sebring had called Greenwald on the evening of August 7, 1969, the day before the murders on Cielo Drive, to report that the TV system was not working. Nothing's working, Greenwald recalled Sebring telling him. It's all not working. O'Neill has also discovered interesting testimony from Amos Russell, sometimes described as Jay Sebring's butler, who told police that on the night of August 7, the night that the cable went out, four of the five Cielo Drive victims, Sebring, Sharon Tate Polanski, Wojciech Frykowski, and Abigail Folger, were together for dinner at Sebring's residence. Although some have deduced something ominous from the fact that four of the five Cielo Drive victims were together on two consecutive nights, all Russell's testimony really shows is that the quartet was apparently inseparable. Of course, now they're together forever. Paul Greenwald further told O'Neill that he had gone to Sebring's house on August 12 to get a suit for Sebring to be buried in, and that while there he noticed that some wires and cable that were part of the system he had installed had apparently been intentionally cut. Since the telephone wire going to the Polanski residence on Cielo Drive had been cut by the killers on August 9, this has led some to the conclusion that the same persons must have been at Sebring's house on Easton Drive the previous night, cutting the wires as a prelude to entering the residence and killing everybody there, only to be spooked and abandon the plan. According to Paul Greenwald, that spooking could have occurred when the killers cut the wire, which reversed the circuit and unexpectedly lit up the lights on the outside of the house. Thwarted by the sudden light show, the killers abandoned their murder plan only to return to complete the job the next night on Cielo Drive. But getting back to the property report, what does Officer Granado's vague entry mean? If the wire was found at Cielo, why the notation Sebring Home? If the wire was retrieved from Sebring's home, why was it? What would prompt police to leave the scene of the Cielo drive murders and go to Jay Sebring's residence and come back with a cut wire? Did police retrieve the wire from Sebring's residence? The police report says that the wire was obtained from 10,050 Cielo Drive, West Los Angeles on 8969, not from Sebring's residence, despite the notation of his home. On August 9, 1969, 10,050 Cielo Drive was a very busy place. Five dead bodies presented Los Angeles law enforcement with the most spectacular and complex murder case of the decade. Is it likely that someone was sent over to the Sebring residence to look for clues? If so, why would that person return to Cielo Drive with only a section of cut wire, especially since the lawyer's son hadn't noticed any severed wires or cables until three days later? It's too bad we can't ask Officer Granado about his cryptic entry. Amos Russell, interviewed by police, said that the only people who were at the Sebring residence between the day of the murders and the interview he was giving that day, August 14, were Jay Sebring's secretary, Charlene McCaffrey, Sebring's business partner, Bob Madden, and Sebring's lawyer's son, Paul Greenwald. He doesn't say anything about any police investigators coming over to search for evidence, such as a cut section of wire. That people like Madden, McGaffrey, and Greenwald were able to come and go at will at Sebring's house in the days after the murders indicates that police didn't think it was any kind of crime scene worth preserving. Charlene, or Carlene McCaffrey, of course, was the girlfriend of one Joel Rostow. The only conclusion I can come to about Joe Granado's wire notation is that I don't know what it means. But beyond that, I have several issues with Greenwald's credibility as a witness. First, 
Amos Russell recalled nothing unusual regarding the electronics in Sebring's house, despite Greenwald's claim that Sebring told him, nothing's working and it's all not working. That sounds like more than just the cable TV being out. Second, his recollections are vague and confusing. He talks about a wire going from inside the house to the outside, a wire that controlled the lights on the grounds, and that that wire had been cut. Cutting that wire would reverse the circuit to the lights on the grounds, turning them off if they were on and on if they were off. He says that they cut that wire in a cable feed. They were cutting everything going into the house, Greenwald said, and when they got to the wire that I had installed, they cut it and all the grounds went up like a Christmas tree. Wires, plural. One apparently a floodlight wire. I think they started cutting at the pole. There was a pole on the edge of his property. The cable TV came off a pole and went into the house separate from my particular wire that was on off the eave of the back of the house. The eave came down and there was a wall that was about a foot away or so and you couldn't walk there or anything so that's why they had the wires drooped or dropped that they found and it was cut. I mean, it was cut, cut. They were right next to it, meaning the house. So Greenwald is talking about more than just one cut wire that could have ended up on the Cielo Drive property report. They cut the wire and the cable feed. They were cutting everything going into the house. And I think they started cutting at the pole. But they also cut the light circuit cord, which was right next to the house. All of this alleged cutting activity indicates that whoever did the cutting must have been familiar with the property layout of Sebring's residence. But although there is ample evidence of Charles Watson's familiarity with 10,050 Cielo Drive, there is no evidence that he or any of the other killers had ever met Jay Sebring or had ever been to his residence. How did they know where the wire was right adjacent to the house? How did they find it in the dark on a moonless night? Finally, Greenwald's comments to O'Neill don't jibe with history, namely his claim that he installed a cable TV system at Jay Sebring's home in 1969 and that that cable was disabled by a cut cable. Cable TV didn't exist in Los Angeles in the summer of 1969. Early cable TV was developed for people who could not receive television signals with antenna, so these such communities accessed a super antenna that would pick up signals and transmit them to viewers via cables. This setup was nothing like cable TV as we think of it today. Cable TV, as we think of it, didn't exist until late 1972. November 8, 1972. Thus, there were no cable television enterprises in Los Angeles in August of 1969 which had established the infrastructure necessary to provide service to such an obscure location as the end of Easton Drive. And I don't have to prove that. The people who say there was such service have to prove that. What was the name of the cable TV company whose service to J. Sebring's house was interrupted by a cut cable on August 7, 1969? That fact alone is enough to cast great doubt on Greenwald's recollections. His confusing vagueness about which wires were cut and how many and where only further cast doubts on his veracity. But even if the wires were cut by the killers, what were the people going to Sebring's house on August 7th going there to do? To kill people? Like what happened the next night? Why? Which people? How did they know they were going to be at either house either night? Were they surveilling them? Who was and how? The electrician says that Amos Russell wouldn't have known about the TV going out if he wasn't there. But Russell says he knew the people were watching TV. Didn't Jay say anything to him about the TV being out? Did he hear Sebring make a call to the electrician? The people who are following this lead have to come up with credible answers to those questions. Here's another scenario, an alternative to the State Knives cable TV theory of what happened on August 9, 1969. After the murders, the killers walked down the cul-de-sac from 10,050 to their car, which was parked on Cielo Drive at the bottom of the cul-de-sac, facing southeast or towards Benedict Canyon Drive. They drove down Cielo towards Benefit and turned left, or northish, 
planning on returning to Spawn's ranch. They changed out of their bloody clothing. Then, looking for a place that had a hose so they could wash blood off of themselves in the car, they turned east, right at the well-lit intersection of Benedict Canyon and Portola Drives. We know that there was a light at that intersection in 1969 because Rudolph Weber testified at the murder trial that there was one. And we know that the killers could easily find his hose for the purpose of washing off because Weber testified that it couldn't have been missed. The turnoff to Portola is in the center of a slight left turn, so it would be very apparent to anyone traveling north on Benedict Canyon. The car had already passed the turnoff to Eastern Drive to Jay Sebring's house. The killers didn't notice it because they were busy changing their clothes in the aftermath of killing five people and the turnoff to Easton was obscured by trees and was not lit and Easton Drive from Benedict Canyon looks more like an alley than a street and the turnoff to Easton is in the middle of a slight right-hand curve in Benedict Canyon and would thus not be apparent to a driver concentrating on going through the curve and the killers did not notice it because they had no idea it was there not being familiar with the roads and certainly not knowing that Jay Sebring lived at the end of the road, something that they would have definitely known if they went there the night before with such accurate precision that they were able to get onto his property on a moonless night and cut the cable right next to the house. The fact that Jay Sebring's killers drove past the turnoff to the street where his house was located was a coincidence. After the well-documented encounter with Rudolph Weber, the quartet got back in the car, left Portola driving north on Benedict Canyon, and disposed of their bloody clothing at the first place they could pull over to do it, at 2901 Benedict Canyon Drive. This location now has a guardrail which prevents vehicle pullovers because too many people were going there to worship. They then proceeded up Benedict Canyon Drive to Mulholland, went west, then turned north on Beverly Glen and tossed the gun out the window so that it landed in Stephen Weiss's backyard on Longview Valley Road. Then they continued on into the San Fernando Valley and any number of routes they could have taken back to Spawn's Ranch. This is the version of events as recalled by the killers themselves. It's perfectly logical and in a straight line. There is no convoluted detour upon leaving 10,050 Cielo no steak knives ditching, and no awareness of Easton Drive. There is nothing unusual or unbelievable about it. The idea that the killers ended up on Portola Drive in a mistaken effort to get to Sebring's house on nearby Easton and that they intended to make an easy walk there as they had made an easy walk up the Cielo Drive cul-de-sac is belied by the testimony of Rudolph Weber. Weber testified that the killer's car was conspicuously parked practically in the middle of the street right by a no parking sign on a street that had no street parking. A car so left while its occupants were on the next block searching Sebring's house for whatever would surely have attracted more attention than clandestine killers would have liked. On the murder night of August 9, 1969, all of the evidence, the murders, the washing at Weber's, the clothes ditching, the gun toss, is undeniably true and fits with the scenario of the killers leaving 10,050 Seattle Drive and returning directly to Spawn's movie ranch. There are no loose ends. The scenario with the tossed knife set and two-night creepy call of Jay Sebring's house is nothing but loose ends. Which scenario do you think is more likely true? I hope that this episode of the podcast has given you some insight into the way I approach evidence in this case. You can't take anything for granted. Every bit of information that you get has to be thoroughly evaluated and questioned to determine whether it really has any relevance to the case at hand. You have to play devil's advocate with yourself, and that's especially true when you're considering some theory that you favor. In the next episode of this podcast, I'm going to do something completely different. That is, host a live podcast in which the guests and I will discuss some of the issues I've raised here. I'll be sure to get the word out as soon as I have the episode ready. I hope you'll be able to watch, and I encourage you to join in. It will be sooner than you think. This has been the Goodbye Helter Skelter podcast. 
the podcast dedicated to the truth about the Tate LaBianca murders, Charles Manson, and more. The views expressed on this program are solely those of the individual speakers, and they do not necessarily represent the thoughts, ideas, or opinions of any other persons, either living or dead. Visit our companion website at www.goodbyehelterskelter.com. There you can find more information about this podcast. Also, check out the Goodbye Helter Skelter Facebook page for information on upcoming programs. And let us know what you think by way of contact at goodbyehelterskelter.com. We will address any comments, questions, or concerns on future installments of the Goodbye Helter Skelter podcast.